Welcome to our video on multiplying polynomials. Here are our objectives. I know it sounds like a lot, but it's all going to boil down to basically the same thing, and it's just a, a form of the distributive property of multiplication. If you can multiply something through a bunch of other things, then you can do all of these, right? And then a little application, um, and then show you how we can kind of expand this multiplying idea out to two things that aren't necessarily uh, polynomials. All right, so let's start with monomials, uh, the most simple of things. And we know that when we multiply one monomial by another, we're basically just multiplying the, the coefficients, the numerical pieces, the numbers, and then we multiply the variable factors as well. Something really simply like these, right? 3x squared times 6x cubed you're literally just multiplying everything together, right? Because that really is 3 times x squared times 6 times x cubed. And because multiplication is commutative, which means you can rearrange things, right? A times B is the same thing as B times A. What we're really doing is we're just kind of rearranging the bits and pieces. And then the 3 gets multiplied by the 6, and that's where we get 18. And then the two x pieces get multiplied together, and we have to know, right, hopefully we already learned this, that when you multiply powers, you just add the exponents. Because remember, that's just two x's times three more x's, and when you put it all together, there's five of them. That's where you get x to the fifth, right? All right. So same thing with this one, right? You multiply the constants, multiply the letters, you know, combine like things, because obviously you can't multiply an x times a y and get anything other than just x, y, right? So you put the x's together, the y's together, and, and um, shrink them together and use powers, right? It's all just about cleaning it up, because technically, you know, this is, is just as correct as this, but this last thing is a lot more concise, right? So that's how we use it. It's cleaner. Okay. How about a polynomial by a monomial? So let's take it up a, a notch. So instead of just a simple one term, right? When we talk about a monomial, it's just one term. Remember, terms are things that are separated by pluses and minuses. So a term is anything that can have uh, numbers and letters, right? So this is one term. This thing has two terms because it's separated by the plus. Two terms separated by the minus. This one has three terms, right? And all you're doing is distributing it through. You're going to take this 3x squared and multiply it by each piece. This big old clunky looking thing, multiply it by each piece. And negative 2ab squared, multiply it by each piece. Right, So you're just distributing. So 3x squared times the first thing. Just like we did before, you multiply the constants. That's going to give you 18, right? You multiply the x's. That's going to give you x cubed. And then the y just goes along for the right. And then you do this times the second piece. And the 3 times the 3 gives you the 9. The x squared has nothing to go with, right? So it's just x squared. And the y squared has nothing to go with, so it's just y squared. It's just that simple, guys. It doesn't matter how many of these examples we do. It's the same thing. You're just distributing through. So really, like I said, all we're doing is the distribution rule, right? We're distributing multiplication across multiple things. Okay, so what happens when we move up another notch and now do a polynomial by a polynomial? Well, guess what? It's the same thing as the last result, result, sorry, only we're going to do it in bits and pieces. So before, if this 3x was gone and it was just a 2, right, you would just distribute the 2. Same thing if the 2 was gone, you would just distribute the 3x. Well, that's all you do. You just do them together, right? So you're going to distribute the 3x. Then you're going to come along and you're going to distribute the 2, and because there's a plus here, you're going to add those two extra pieces you distribute, right? So it's going to be 3x times the 4, 3x times the 9, and so on and so forth. Now you could also do it the other way and kind of do 4 times both of these pieces, and then 9 times both of these pieces. But really, guys, it just comes down to distributing. So we're going to take the first one, multiply it all the way through, move on to the second one, multiply it all the way through. And that's where they get this FOIL method. And yes, you've, I'm sure you've all heard the FOIL method before. I'm not a big fan of the FOIL method, and I'll tell you why. Because the FOIL method makes you feel like there's this special method that you use whenever you're multiplying two what we call binomials, because they have two, like a bicycle has two wheels, a binomial has two nomials, right, two little pieces. So anytime you have something plus something times something plus something or something minus something times something minus, right? So it could be either plus or minus, doesn't matter. And they don't have to both be the same. 
Um, anytime you have that situation, it's a FOIL because you're going to multiply first terms. This thing times this. You see how those are both first terms? Then you're going to do outside. This one times the outside. Then you're going to do the inner, right? Then you're going to do the last. So F-O-I-L, FOIL. But what did we really do? We literally just did what we've been doing with all of these examples, and we just did normal distributing. We just distributed one thing through and then distributed the next. So look at all you're doing, right? If, if we forget about FOIL and we just go back to what I've been saying, and that's just take the first thing and distribute it through. Then take the second thing and distribute it through. That's what FOIL is, right? Because when you distribute this through, do 3x times x, this piece, then 3x times 4, this piece. Well, this was your first, right? 3x times 4, you see how those are both on the outside? That's your outside, right? Then you move on to the next piece, okay? So 2 times x, this piece, that's the inner, right? And then 2 times 4, that's this piece, those are both last, so there's your FOIL right? Okay, fine. Call it FOIL. But really, just think about it as distributing. And the reason why I want you to think about it as distributing is what happens when you have uh, 3x squared plus 2x minus 3 times x squared minus 2x plus 4. And now you have to multiply these. Well, now FOIL doesn't work because you don't have a first an outside, an inside, and a last, because you got three pieces, right? What the heck do you call it when you multiply this thing times this? Uh, middle first, right? And then this thing times this, uh, middle, middle. So that's why I don't like FOIL, is it makes you feel like there's a, a whole new way of doing something when it's really just the same thing. Start with the first term, multiply it through. Multiply it times this, then this, then this, right? Then move on to the second term, multiply it through. Then move on to the third term, multiply it through. Combine all your like stuff, right? As you multiply these things, you'll see this. Oh, this one has a x cubed, this one has an x cubed, I can put those together. This one has an x squared, this one has an x squared, I can put those together, right? So that's all we're doing. It's just when we have these special ones, we have this lovely little FOIL acronym. Ugh, just distribute. All right, so here's another example. Again, just distribute it through. If you want to think of it as FOIL, that's fine, but I really like you guys to generalize because sooner or later, you are going to have to multiply a 3 by 3, right? Or a, a 3 by a 2, or a 2 by a 3. And, and what I mean by a 3 by 3, I mean something like this, where you've got three terms and three terms, okay? So it's nice to be able to generalize to more advanced stuff. Okay, how about squaring a binomial? and multiplying two conjugate binomials. Again, this is just a special application, right? special versions of what we've already done. So we can square a binomial by writing it out twice and then basically foiling or doing our distribution method. Um, once you recognize the pattern, you know how to square a binomial just by doing the pattern, and that's fine if you know that pattern. If not, just write it out, right? If I have to square this, I'm just going to write it out as x plus y times x plus y, and then I'm going to go ahead and distribute through, right? First term times here and times there, and then second term times there and times there. Add any like terms, and I'm done. And that's what we're doing here. Same thing if it's a minus. Really, all that changes is some symbols become minuses instead of pluses. And that's why um, you can end up learning the pattern really easily when you square uh, simple binomials. You know what the pattern is. It's always the first term squared plus two times their product plus the second term squared. Right. So here it is, the first term squared plus two times their product, so x times y times 2, and then plus the second one squared. And if this is a minus, it's just the first thing squared minus two times their product, but then still plus the second thing squared. All right. If you want to memorize that, great, but it really it's not worth the brain power. Just um, write them out and FOIL them out, right? Write them out and do the distribution method every single time. Okay, how about conjugate binomials? Conjugate binomials just means, and in fact, you hear the word conjugate all the time. Two conjugates are just the same thing 
with different signs, right? So x plus y and x minus y are conjugates. So if you multiply x plus y times x minus y, these are two conjugates, you end up getting just x squared minus y squared because the middle piece cancels out. That's the beauty of conjugates is you don't get that middle piece, that middle 2xy piece. So we use conjugates a lot to do things like get rid of radicals and deal with um, imaginary numbers and complex numbers, and they have a lot of applications. So it's good to know what a conjugate is. Anytime you hear conjugate, it's going to be for a binomial, right? A binomial has a conjugate because it has to be something plus something, and then its conjugate is going to be that same thing minus that same thing. And vice versa, if you started with A minus B, its conjugate is just A plus B. So again, these are just nice things that if you have them memorized, it saves you some time. You know that you know when you do conjugates, you always get this pattern. But if you don't remember it, who cares? Write them out and then distribute it out. Some stuff will cancel and you'll figure out what you got. Okay, how about another example or two? This is just reminding us that um, order of operations matters. When we have parentheses, we always have to do the inner parentheses first and work our way outward. So if we have something funky like this with these weird parentheses, first we have to do the inside stuff first, which means first we have to multiply, distribute through by this negative two, right? Because there's a negative in front of it. So that's where we get x squared minus 2x, right? And then minus 6. Now the inner parentheses are gone. We can work on the outer parentheses, which just means distributing the 3 through. And you can see that's all we did here was distribute the 3. And then now this ugly looking thing is just a simple little polynomial. It's actually a quadratic. That's something you'll hear a lot. A quadratic is anything that has three terms where you've got a squared piece, a linear piece, and a constant. That's a quadratic. Okay, how about solving an application when it requires us to multiply polynomials? And this comes up all the time, especially in simple economic things, because profit is always going to be revenue minus cost. Revenue is always going to be number of things sold times their price. So we talk about that as XP, where X is the number of items and P is the price. Now, guys, this is all basic, basic things, right? Obviously, advanced economics, things get far more complicated than this. But in a very basic sense, your revenue, your profits, right? How much money you make is always how much money you bring in, your revenue, minus your costs, right? If you earn $200, but it costs you $50, you only had a profit of $150. And then that revenue is normally based on, you know, unless you're talking about labor, but revenue when you're selling something is based on the price of the item times how many you sold, right? You sell three sandwiches and they cost five bucks each, you just made $15, right? It's that simple. So these are simplistic versions of economics that just help us illustrate some things. So how about this? A saleswoman has determined that the number of vacuums X that she can sell at price P is related to this equation x, remember that's the number that she can sell, is equal to negative two-fifths p plus 28, where p is the price. So now we want to find a formula for revenue and then figure out how much revenue will be taken in if the vacuums are priced at 250. So, you know, it's actually kind of a real-world thing. We want to know, um, you know, what's going to maximize our revenue, um, and, and we could use calculus to figure that out. But in these simple things, we can just figure out how much money we will make at a price of 250. Then we can figure out how much we can make at a price of 200, and so on and so forth. And we can kind of figure out what the best price is. You know, which one maximizes revenue? Because it's not necessarily just the highest price. Because as the price goes up, people are going to buy less of them. As the price goes down, people are going to buy more of them. So all we have to do really is plug in what we know using the formulas that we have. We have that simple formula that revenue is just price times x. They tell us that in this case, we have a formula for x, right? x was negative 2 fifths p plus 28. So if we put that in for x and then distribute the p through, you see how we get things with p squared, right? Negative 2 25ths p squared plus 28p. That's our revenue. Okay, so we found a simple formula for revenue that's based on just price. If we just know the price and we don't 
know anything about how many units are sold, right? Because there's no X left in there. All we have is P's for price. Then we can figure out what our revenue is. Really simple. And then if we want to figure out how much revenue we'll make at a price of 250, all we're going to do is slap a 250 in for P, right? So remember, order of operations. First, you got to square it. Then you got to multiply it by negative 2 25ths, and that's where you get negative 5,000. Here, it's just a simple multiplication. Put those two things together, and your revenue is going to be $2,000 if you price it at 250. All right, last but not least, how about multiplying two expressions that are not polynomials? Well, guess what, guys? It's still the same silly thing. Take the first one, distribute it through, right? So you multiply it by the first one, multiply it by the second one. Move on to the next piece, multiply it to the first one, multiply it by the second one, combine any like terms, right? Remembering rules that if you have X's and Y's, you can't combine things. But if you have X's and X's, those combine, right? Y's and Y's, those combine. Clean it up, and there's your final answer, okay? So it doesn't matter what you're multiplying, the rules don't change, it's just being systematic. Grab the first term, multiply it through, move on to the next term, multiply it through, move on to the next term, multiply it through, and keep repeating that process till you go through all of them, then combine like terms, clean it up, and you're done. All right, that is everything we need to know for multiplying polynomials.